Kyle Anderson, who I'm in line with, and where are you calling in from? Hey, this is Merrill from Washington. Merrill, what's up? I appreciate you calling in uh, from Washington. Is this uh, like the state Washington or or, uh, the, or D.C.? Now, this is the state of Washington. All right. Well, <laughs> Over here in what used to be the Pac-12 nation. <laughs> yeah, after my, my whole rant that the Pac-12 doesn't mean anything, this should be fun. Uh, Merrill from Washington calling in. I'm excited to have you uh, join the show for the first time. Feel at home, Merrill. So, um, you know, welcome on in. And, um, you know, you can hit on any of the headlines or uh, bring whatever else you got to the table, man. But uh, go ahead, Merrill. Oh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I was just listening to that Pac-12 rant. That was that was good. But I mean, I mean, it made a great point. And I think for me, calling in, um, I really wanted to kind of touch some points on like the coaching staff and what you guys are actually getting. Um, just a little background: like I played in the Pac-12. Uh, <laughs> oddly enough, I watched a lot of football of it. I was recruited into the SEC, but ended up staying where I was from, uh, and coached some high school football. And on top of that, did some player development. So I have a little bit of a background, but I think the, the most important thing when we're looking at this and, and just, I'm, a, I'm a bit, also a big Alabama fan. Now, when I was being recruited, Alabama was not there, but they are now, obviously, right? And, and they have been since Saban came. Um, but what's interesting with, with Coach DeBoer uh, and, and, and just wanting to get the Alabama fans excited, because what you're getting in this coach is, is just phenomenal. I mean, if you watch the games and you watch kind of the way he, he poises himself on the sidelines and the way those players kind of rally around and, and focus with that poise, it's, it's amazing to see a team, maybe that Washington, if you look at that roster, just wasn't, I mean, the talent was there maybe within your starting lineup, but you go into the depth, there was no depth, zero. But he's able to take a team with a few recruits here and there um, that were semi-good from where they came from. I wouldn't say they were the best, but put, put them in a system that, really, that was really amazing to watch them all just prosper, right? Um, and with DeBoer, I mean, you, you look at his background, too. Uh, and with his background, I mean, he comes from Bob Young. Bob Young at Sioux Falls, right? Just small NAIA school. Um, that there's not a lot of resources there. You don't got big time players. Uh, but what you do have, right, is people that buy in. Bob Young was 172 and 69 as a head coach. That's who DeBoer gets to learn from. It, you look back, it's kind of funny to connect Alabama and Washington, right? But you look back, Saban learned from Don James. Don James was the famous coach from Washington that led him to a national title, and he was 178 and 76. And I mean, if you go even further back and we really want to dig into like Alabama history, right? You look at Bear Bryant and Bear Bryant came from Frank Thomas. And, and I mean, and he, Frank Thomas is, I'm sure everybody knows on here is 141 in 33. Mm -hmm. Like, so each of these coaches, right. They all have, they come from winning tradition and understanding how to win. Maybe, Bear Bryant being maybe the original Alabama, right? But with with Saban, with the Boar, you get to see this um, from maybe non traditional like SEC backgrounds, but but coming in and, and doing something amazing at each place they go, right? Mm -hmm. Which is winning, mm -hmm. and I and I think that's probably one of the most exciting things you you have to truly think about as a fan is say, man it's so hard to follow up a legend mm -hmm. and it's so hard to come in there and be like, how do you, how do you take over a program that has something so ingrained, so established for so long and has such a, such a perfect winning tradition. I mean, what, what coach who has it pretty good, right? At Washington, right? He has everything established. The board does within two years, what he's wanted. He, he can start to kind of do kind of what he wants and he's going to get a nice contract based on what we've read, maybe in the news, but who, who would want to follow that? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think you start to get excited because you have to say to yourself, Whoa, th this guy stepped away from something really, really good. Um, mm -hmm. Something in Julie, they're going, they're going to the big 10 next year. Like, right. You can, mm -hmm. it's still pretty competitive. I would say, right. You still got to have state Michigan and maybe a few other schools who are, 
semi decent, but um, but man, you look at this guy willing to take on such a such a task. You got to feel inspired. That so you got a coach that who says, "Hey, I'm going to raise my hand, and say I'm good enough to do it. Like I'm the next man up." Mm-hmm. That's that's a that's like man, like wow, that's a, that's amazing, right? Because I mean, there's not very many coaches. I think I think you you were to give it to Sark, you were to give it to Kirby. Maybe Kirby probably would be the closest one who could come in and and continue something just because of what he's already built at Georgia. Uh, and then, you, you know, everyone wants to talk about Dan Lanning. And Dan's done a great job at Oregon, and, I, and a lot of props to him, right? He's made Oregon a powerhouse. But yeah. you got to ask yourself also how much, how much between Texas and Oregon is that NIL money, mm-hmm. you know? Um, because if you look back, but, yeah, Oregon's maybe been – pretty good over the years um making some championships kind of dominating the the pac-12 but um but when it comes down to it you know the sec has oregon won against sec teams <laughs> like how much have they won sure sure you know, and no, i, I don't it. think you you see that so um but i also think with the boar what's what's probably the most interesting thing with that is I didn't realize this until I kind of I started digging into this. You know, at one point he had the longest winning streak in the nation at any level in college football. That's in, that's insane. <laughs> I mean, that, granted, yeah, okay, we're, you want to go back to NI, I, NI or NAIA. That's what a lot of people will argue, right? But you're doing that with very – the talent level is just not the same, right? And now he's inheriting this – this amazing talent yeah. at, at Alabama, but he's also showing his, his, his sincerity, right. And the way he goes about his business. Mm-hmm. And I think you saw that if you look back at his records, uh, Fresno state and, and now and Washington, and like I say, in Sioux Falls, I mean, you see that in his records. Right? right. And so that's, that has to be very exciting for an Alabama fan to say, wow, you know, we're, it's demoralizing losing someone like Saban, right? It's funny because I was watching Rolling with the Tide just last night, the the, the last season on ESPN uh-huh. training days, mm-hmm. and you watch you watch Saban, right? And you're like, dang, this guy, man, like he just has it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knows how to speak, you know, he's himself, um, and, and he and he knows how to get people to buy in. Mm-hmm. What's exciting, I think, for Alabama is you're entering this new era where you're going, wow, this guy. DeBoer knows how to get people to buy in and he surrounds himself with really good people who also buy in. And I think I saw one comment on there that people were like not excited about Womack. And I, and I, and I thought about that and I was like, yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Like you look at some of these coaches who he's bringing in with, I mean, with his coordinators, maybe with like Kane Womack, Ryan Grubb, I would be super excited about. I wouldn't even question that. Ryan Grubb's had success in every offense he has ran. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he came from the high school ranks. Mm-hmm. That was a high school coach. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he came up with the board. You know, I mean, and it's funny because if you listen to Andy Reid and the NFL talk about high school coaches, you know, that's sometimes that's where they start to poach. They mm-hmm. start to look for new things out of high school coaches. Mm-hmm. That's like a Ryan Grubb. You know, that's the type of guy they're going to go after. So, I mean, but with Kane Womack, you jump back into what, what he's bringing to the table. And honestly, you just look at his pedigree. You know, Dave ran, his dad ran that 4 5 defense uh, at Ole Miss, right? Back when he was the coach there in prior. But you, you look at that defense and you look at what it built and how successful he was. And maybe some of these other teams who do run it with even into the NFL and you look at what it's made for, right? And it's it's truly made for speed. And what does Alabama have? The majority of the time, and the SEC has, they have speed. And if you want to match up with speed, you got to play with speed. And I think that's what's, what's important and will be really exciting about the 4 5 defense, something very different than what Alabama has seen. Granted, they did make a little bit of a switch within the last few years. I mean, you saw more of those DBs on the field, and they ran something very similar and how they presented themselves right at a, as a base um, to the four two five. But I mean, you also have to, you know, again, like go back into it. People like question some of these guys, you know, like Mo Linquist. 
Mm-hmm. That's an interesting one, you know, because with Mo, everyone's going well, at Buffalo. He wasn't very successful, mm-hmm. right? Like, okay, well, that's as a head head coach, and maybe he didn't have all the necessary pieces he needed to, along with players that he needed to be successful. Maybe he had the he had the vision, but sometimes that vision takes some time to come together. And we know nowadays within coaching, time is not on your side. You have to win now. <laughs> so, and I think too, like um, Colin Hitchler, right? Like that's going to be, that's going to be an interesting one as Colin being just rated the way he was, you know, he was a top upcoming coach in 2022 and, and Wisconsin credits him for like, almost three quarters of their recruiting. Um, and, and they actually started to bring in some, some higher quality recruits than maybe just what your average three star, couple of four stars. And if you're lucky, a five star. Right. And so you, you think about between Hitchler and Linquist and Linquist too, with that NFL background, I think if you're a defensive back and you're looking at Mo Linquist, who is such, such a technician, um, Linquist has some really great uh, videos on YouTube that talk about like his philosophy, especially if you look at like the American football coaching association, right. And you listen to Mo Linquist talk. I mean, that guy is a technician. He is, he is so about the details, but he's also really about building his players, man. He wants to build his players. And I don't think he gets enough credit for some of the things he has done. Uh, but yeah, if we go back, I heard you talking about this, Kyle, with with Dallas Cowboys, right? Yeah. At the time that that single year he was there, yeah. Right. At Dallas was like one of the top ranked pass defenses. They weren't that good, oddly enough, right? Um, Dallas in general, like I guess you should, I could, I should say their defense in general, but their pass defense was actually rated mm-hmm. uh, in the upper top ten in the league. I mean, that's impressive. Mm-hmm. And if I'm a DB and I'm saying man, how do I get to the league? Because that's what a lot of these kids are, are asking, right? Maybe besides the money aspect of NIL, that's changed so much of the landscape. But a lot of these kids are going, how do I get to the league? Like, who is going to help me get to the league? And now you start to have this coaching staff who's young, has some experience, but also are starting to deliver. I mean, that's why Freddie Roach is so exciting, right? Because he's starting to put out these dudes who are just, who are just animals. And he hasn't even been in the position that long you know he's kind of played different roles at different schools he's been at um but now alabama you're going to see this production really come through I, and i think you're going to see it this next year with the way that 425 is meant to run and how much it centers yes it focuses on the safeties but y- your anchor is your d-line mm-hmm. right and those tackles are really important um and i think you'll you'll get a, they get a chance to finally be highlighted as like those anchors and, and you'll see that in, in these guys coming and showing up on the line and the way they're going to play. I mean, and then on top of that, if you switch over the offense, you look at Jamarcus Shepard. I mean, and something what's interesting with Shepard too, I mean, is everywhere he's been as a wide receivers coach, he has produced his ballers. I mean, you look at him at with Jeff Brom at Purdue. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I didn't know he was coaching Rondale Moore. Right. Um, and then there's another guy whose last name is Bell. He was also a big time wide receiver who had over a thousand yards. So you got two thousand yard receivers at Purdue before he comes to Washington. And then he takes that Washington receiving core who coming out of high school, you got, yeah, you got, you got Jalen Polk. Uh, I think he was, he was number two. He was a three star. Yet Roma Dunze was a four star and McMillan was a four star, but they weren't like extremely highly ranked four stars. Mm-hmm. Um, their production levels weren't the greatest, but all of a sudden they come into this offense and just show out. I mean, you start to see these guys like have confidence. You start to see these guys like making plays and the offense just opens up and allows them to make plays in space. And that's where Jamarcus Shepard is probably the most exciting is like you, you see everywhere he goes, the development he brings in. But I think the most exciting one and everybody will like this um, from an Alabama standpoint I mean, I know I did, is when I look at Scott Huff. Yeah. Like, Scott Huff, that dude, as an offensive line coach, that, that guy knows how to make something out of nothing. I mean, 
and now he doesn't have nothing. Now we have he has some serious talent, right, on that offensive line, um, Alabama. I mean, you look at Scott Huff, and, I mean, that guy, he was a Broyles Award nominee back in 2016, and that was when he was coaching at Boise State. And Boise State at that time also was like a semifinalist for the Jim Moore Award. And then he comes to Washington, turns that offensive line completely around, right? They win the Joe Moore Award. And I think for, for them, for the 2023 season, I think they only gave up 11 sacks. Like, that's, that's amazing. Jalen Milrow was sacked 44 times. And you want to you <laughs> put a quarterback and, like, you think about, like, the mindset, right, of, like, a quarterback. Think about this when you're back there taking a snap, and, and I've already heard everyone talking about the snap issues, and I saw it too when I watched the games in Alabama. But you're taking a snap. Not only do you have to find the ball, because you you, you're not expecting it to be in the same place every time because the snaps are all over the place, but you're also you have determined after the first couple of games that you're probably going to have to run for your life, right? Like you're going to have to start moving in that pocket really fast. Um, and you're going to have to get rid of that ball really fast. So for, for Milro, you know, a lot of people were kind of dogging on him about like throwing the ball. Right. And, and, it, and it's a bummer because truthfully he was way better than I think what everyone was giving him credit for, you know? Um, and I mean, Milro from like a, a deep ball percentage, like he was better it, or sorry, he was almost just as good as, as Penix. I think Milrow had a 52% and, and Medix was at, Penix was at, sorry, 43%. Um, and then you look at like the overall, uh, the, the overall, I guess, way that Penix had time to throw and not to mention he had these wide receivers who mm-hmm. were, who were playing with space. Yeah. Milrow was on the run trying to constantly move, you know, made a read, tried to get to his second read, but then had to take off because at that point he did not have the time to, to go through a full completion of his reads. And, and, and the way he's having to look for the ball, he's not even getting time to, to, to observe the defense. So, I mean, from that perspective alone, you just got to be really excited to say, man, it, to imagine that, let's just say that sack drop, the sack number of times Milrow sack drops down to 20, right? That that's that's that is so much better and so much more exciting for him because now you get to really see his true potential with his arm and that guy has a cannon. I mean, in this in this offense, you're going to see that. Like, if you go back, you watch Washington through through this last season. That ball is going downfield, right? You're not seeing these, you know, I guess ten to fifteen yard as much as you're seeing over fifteen yard or under ten, right? And that's just because of utilizing space, utilizing what they had and getting the balls into the, the wide receiver's hands so they could, they could make plays with their feet just because of how explosive they were. And that's going to be exciting because that's what I think Alabama has as well. You know, and, I, and granted, there's a lot of big question marks if you look at the roster, right, with as far as who's going to start where and, and whatnot. But I think that's going to be probably the most exciting thing about going into um, spring ball is saying, okay, like we, we have some – we we have these we have all these different aspects we have some really key areas that we know we're we're going to be solid on other areas we have big question marks right but what is exciting is that we have the coaching staff in place to take those question marks and make them into big time stars and that has to sit there and say wow like Alabama has all this talent and now they're they're taking that talent and putting it into this offense that DeBoer has been so successful in um, and with the coaching staff and a defensive coordinator who's going to give passion and excitement, but on top of that, has the pedigree to show like his success, um, just from an overall, even when he doesn't have talent, how successful he can be. And you kind of saw that with Indiana, right? And so, I mean, I don't know. I think for, for me, I just wanted to really call in after listening to the show and reading all over, right, about the different um, different comments and kind of the downplay of, of Alabama. And just, I think for me, just kind of really 
sit there and give the fans some hope and say, hey, like, you, you guys, be excited. Like, this is, this is a great time to be pumped up. Like, yes, you lost the legend. And, and, and Nick Saban is it's just amazing, right? So fun to watch. But dang, to, to sit there and, and say, how do you follow that up? And then you have a guy who raises his hand and say, I'm, I'm going to step up. I want to follow that. That's exciting. That, I mean, shoot, what guy wouldn't want to go play for someone who is saying, guess what? I'm going to follow that guy and be just as good. Come play with me. You know, I, and I think that's what you're seeing with the locker room buying in right now. Good call, uh, Merrill calling in. This is kind of a setup call. Uh, we knew that Merrill was going to call on the back end, uh, so I appreciate it with the insight on uh, the Alabama coaching staff. Really good job, man. Um, I'm going to move to my next caller, but I really appreciate all uh, the insight. Um, would like to have you again uh, call, and when we 